these are just uh, a few pictures of the loves of my life, my wife, my two sons, and some of my pursuits. And I've enjoyed a profitable career, first in the investment industry, then in the mining industry, uh, building Gold Corp and investing in the dreams of geologists, explorers, prospectors. And I've made a lot of money doing that. And uh, many people have asked me why I keep working. And this is why I keep working. It's what we can do with what we earn and how we can share it with society to make a better world in which we live in. And um, in here, um, my wife and I started, funded a medical research center to do work in regenerative medicine and stem cell research with the belief that that would make many more people healthier and reduce some of the costs in our healthcare system and the crisis we're facing there. There's leadership programs because we need more leaders. We need more entrepreneurs. And it's trying to inspire people to reach. Uh, mining has been very good to me in that there, it's generated the funds that finance this. And much of the profits that comes out of McEwen Mining will go straight into these areas. Um, so just a quick word about the information. There's this necessary safe harbor statement uh, basically, it's, uh, you should read it at some point at your leisure. Um, but it's really saying if you're risk adverse, don't bother investing in us. And that um, any of the statements we're making, which are forward looking, should be treated as um, with some degree of skepticism because they may not come to pass. Um, and I'm getting into Chris's slides right now. We're all going to give you a little insight into who we are. Um, I'm delighted to say that we've covered a large amount of the ground that we lost in the first quarter, and we're moving much faster going forward. But I'd like to talk about the six areas where we've made the biggest gains. First is in the area of management, senior management, uh, both financial operating and exploration. We've added uh, building the depth of our firm and the experience to take on new projects. Uh, second, we've constructed and delivered our fourth mine, the Gold Bar Mine, um, into commercial production. It was close to budget and it was just overdue, but um, it's now, we declared commercial production effective today. Three, we've made significant improvements in the operations at Black Fox through cost reductions, and that should become quite evident within the third quarter. Um, fourth, we have an aggressive exploration program, and I just want to say that I've always been a big fan of exploration as driving value, and uh, you're going to hear more about that today, but our press releases are highlighting some of the very rich intersections that we've encountered recently in our drilling this year. Uh, five, in Mexico, we're advancing uh, the silver project we had, which we used to call El Gallo II, which has been renamed the Phoenix Project. It's about five miles from our El Gallo mine. We were able to do something I thought quite elegant and find a way of reducing the capital, reducing the environmental impact, and, and future reclamation. And six, uh, the wild card in our portfolio is the Los Azules Copper Project. And we've been able to determine a route that would give us access 12 months of the year. Right now, it's only a, a four, maybe five month access that we can get because of the high mountain passes and the snows. And I believe that route, when construct, once constructed, will create significant value for the company. Um, I'd also like to apologize to all of our shareholders. Apologize for the pain that we all went through in the first couple of months of this year. Um, it was, uh, at one point, I know at the end of February, it was, look, I, I was looking into an abyss and I wondered what had happened to us. There were all these things that had occurred. Um, I'm delighted to say that we've made up much of the lost ground and going forward, it's just looking better. But um, I know how painful and how it may have tested your patience with us. Uh, 
At this point, I'd now like to ask Chris to come forward, talk about our operations, and there's a starting slide. Thank you, Rob. Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, just wanted to introduce my family. Uh, I have my wife, uh, Beth, and my son, Wesley. He's 13, going to be 14 this year. As you can see, he's a goalie. So pretty tough job for him and being a goalie parent for those of you who have lived that life. Uh, we also have what I call a zoo at home. So we have two dogs, two cats. The two cats came when I was working away at other, other jobs, and I didn't have much of a decision on that, I guess. So we ended up with Maya and Sushi are the two cats. And then the German Shepherd is uh, Jazzy and then Daisy, and she's a rescue dog. We're not sure what she is. We call her a Bitsy. So a bit of this and a bit of that. So I would like to also do a quick safety share with all the precipitation we've had, not only in, in uh, Canada, Northern Ontario, and down in the U.S. where we're working in Nevada, <coughs> but all across the country. It's one thing that I've always been fearful of when Wesley was growing up was, you know, him, water brings little kids to it. So whether it's a puddle or a creek, kids wander around, start playing in there, and at this time of year, you've got lots of spring melt, lots of things happening, and those creek levels can change quickly, and water flows change very quickly and can sweep little ones away. So if you have grandkids or kids, just be aware of that at this time of year, especially, and keep an eye on them when they're around that kind of uh, areas. So we'd like to take this opportunity to share our thoughts uh, around McEwen, what we're up to, and what our plans are going forward. You can see we have number of operations across North and South America. We have the uh, new gold bar mine in commercial production as of today down in Nevada. We have the Black Fox Mine Complex in Northwest, Northern Ontario. And then we have El Gallo Gold down in Sinaloa, Mexico. And then we have the Mammoth Los Azules project sitting down there in the Andes on the west side of Argentina on the border with Chile. And then we have our joint venture project with Hochschild sitting down there in southern Argentina. Two of our producing assets are located in a highly prolific, world-class gold mining camp. Our new gold bar mine is centrally located on the Cortez Trend. This area of Nevada has produced over 224 million ounces of gold and continues to produce over 5 million ounces of gold this year. In addition, we have the Black Fox Complex. You can see in around from Timmins to Matheson, 85 million ounces of historic production coming out of that area, and along the entire trend in the Abitibi, 185 million ounces. Very substantial areas to have gold mines. What is even more exciting is that we don't just have any claims in these two areas. We have the claims, right claims, located on the right geology. We are aggressively exploring both of these properties this year, and we are excited about the potential for new gold discoveries. Sylvana's exploration team We'll discuss more of this during their part of the presentation. As Rob, Rob mentioned earlier, we're extremely pleased to announce that the gold bar mine has moved into commercial production. Uh, and you're probably wondering, what does that mean? Well, what we're saying is that our mining and processing operation is up and running and is behaving as planned. All major expenditures on the project are complete and all facilities have been turned over to the McEwen operations team. The mining activities on the mountain are progressing as planned, and we see strong reconciliation between actual and forecasted grades and tons. The gold recovery plan is performing as designed, and recoveries are tracking well to the recovery curve we had developed in our feasibility study. As you can see here at Gold Bar, just to give you a quick little rundown, this is the heap leach pad, and you can see all of the new ore stacked, and we're working our way up the east side of the pad right now. And then we have our gold recovery building sitting down here, with the solution bonds, and then our office complex sitting over here, and we're actually mining gold pick is up over here in cabin. You can't quite see, but it's down in that area there. So we're loading the heat pad with the ore handling system, which includes a jaw, jaw crusher, a screening plant, an agglomeration drum, and a stacker. We've averaged 5,470 tons per day over the past 28 days, which is 75% of our planned production rate of 7,200 tons per day. And we have had several days where we've operated at more than 120% of plan. We will continue to ramp up the full production over the next couple of months. It has been challenging with the unusually wet and snowy winter and spring we got hit with. In fact, it was the wettest winter on record in the USA. But we've gotten through it. We're making changes this summer with the ore handling system to ensure that we are properly prepared to handle the elements next winter. And Jack will speak more about that 
in a few minutes. We're on target to meet our 2019 guidance of 50,000 ounces, and we're expecting to produce around 80,000 ounces in 2020. Currently, we're mining two separate pits. You have the gold pick pit, as I mentioned, sitting over here, and Cabin Creek sitting over here. But what we're really excited about is what they are potentially sitting on top of, the depth potential of this. And again, Sylvain and his exploration team will be speaking to that later in the presentation. So the Black Fox mine and mill, we bought that back in 2007, October 2017, for $35 million. And while we're currently only mining one deposit, and that's the Black Fox mine here, producing 50,000 ounces a year, we see tremendous potential on this property. This is why we're investing heavily in the exploration program, and we're advancing engineering and economic studies on both Gray Fox and the Froome deposit. Our focus in bringing Gray Fox, uh, sorry, bringing the Gray Fox complex into production in the next two to four years is the fact that you have the potential to be mining three separate and possibly four, we're chasing the Gibson zone right now, which Ken will talk about a little bit later, but we have three deposits here that we conceptually believe we can access from, from one ramp. So again, reducing capital and looking to increase our margin on the, on the, on the work. We also have the advantage of taking uh, the synergies with respect to the Black Fox mine. We already have all the infrastructure in place on site, powers on site, water, treatment ponds, loading facilities, everything you need. We can take advantage of that and again, help drive down our operating costs going forward. Plus we have a management team in place which is looking after Black Fox. You can easily take on more work with other deposits by just adding incremental people. You don't have to have another general manager for each of those deposits. You have one and they oversee that entire complex. In addition to that, we have the stock property, which is where our mill is located. It's about 23 miles away to the west. And our mill is sitting right here on top of the old, uh, old uh, stock mine. We came out with an initial inferred resource last year for stock east, sitting over here. To build on, and we're going to build on that exploration program this year. We also have depth potential below the old mine workings. And you can see these colors. The pinks are the hotter colors, are higher grades. So you can see there's something happening here, trending down with the old stock mine, and then again, what we've done out on stock east. So I can see this actually coming back online and being another mining operation for us in probably five to six years' time. In mining, they always say the best place to find gold is in the shadow of a head frame, and that's what we have right here at stock. We envision the Timmins operation between Black Fox property and stock property we're looking at producing 100 to 120,000 ounces per year of production within the next four to five years. Down in Mexico at the El Gallo mine, we finished mining in mid-2018, and we are continuing to perform residual heap leaching activities today. Our guidance for 2019 is 13,000 gold equivalent ounces, and we're on track to meet that. Our team has been working on the next phase of life for the operation, and that is Project Phoenix. The feasibility study was underway for several months and we're on schedule to have it completed by the end of June. In parallel to that, we're advancing the permitting work as well and we expect to receive approval in Q3. The Phoenix project would be completed in two phases so we can reduce the upfront capital cost. Phase one would include reprocessing the El Gallo heap leach tails into a new process facility, which you can see sitting up here. These are new components that we would be building. This is existing infrastructure here with the offices. So we would be building that, running the heap leach material, reprocessing it through a, through a mill and leaching circuit and get the rest of the gold out of that. And then at the same time in phase two, we would then be looking to bring on El Gallo Silver sitting out here to the north of El Gallo Gold. And then another couple other satellite deposits, which Miguel will speak about during his part of the presentation. So based on the results from our preliminary economic assessment that we completed in mid-2018, we're expecting an annual production rate of between 45 and 50,000 ounces of gold over a 10 to 12 year mine life. So we're very excited about the potential for this operation. In Argentina, we have the Los Azules project, which is a massive copper deposit. This is a mega mining project that will require deep pockets to build. We understand that, and we were focused on trying to secure a partner to move this project ahead. In the meantime, we are focused on de-risking the project with the northern route access, as Rob mentioned, which would provide year-round access to the deposit, and we are continuing to push ahead with the permitting work. These are low-cost initiatives that we feel could add significant value 
by making the project more attractive to a strategic partner. The economics are compelling. Net present value of 2.2 billion, a 3.6 year payback, and a 36 year mine life. Extraordinary, really. If it was not located in such a remote area of Argentina, I'm sure it would already be a mine today. Finally, we have the San Jose joint venture down in southern Argentina. We own 49% of the property and Hochschild owns 51% and are the operators of the complex. We're anticipating 92,000 ounces of gold equivalent production for 2019. That would be the McEwen share. And the current mine life is five years, but they have been operating continuously since 2007 and have an excellent track record of replacing ounces on an annual basis. So we remain very excited about this property as well. We are fortunate to have great people and great assets. These are key ingredients to building a successful gold company. The properties within our current portfolio are world class, and we are focused on adding mine life and reducing our cost per ounce at all of our operations. I look forward to meeting you after the presentations to hear your thoughts, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Before I hand this off to Bob McDonald, our general manager for Ontario, we'd like to show this introductory video. In Ontario, Canada, McEwen Mining owns a 100% interest in the Black Fox Complex, located in the Beattie and Hislop Townships. The mill and stock property and the Black Fox Mine are approximately 40 and 60 miles east of the city of Timmins, respectively, and the world-renowned Timmins Gold Camp. The complex is positioned directly on the Destor Porcupine Fault Zone, internationally known as the Golden Highway which has produced over 90 million ounces of gold from various operations. McEwen Mining purchased the Black Fox Complex for $35 million in the fall of 2017. The acquisition came with an underground mine currently producing 50,000 ounces per year, a mill with 2,400 tons per day capacity, gold resources exceeding 1 million ounces, as well as multiple properties which have significant exploration upside and the potential to extend mine life. Historic production within the Black Fox complex totals over 1.7 million ounces from both open pit and underground mining. The Black Fox complex and stock properties consist of multiple projects which have a cumulative 12 miles length of prospective structure and geology. For 2019, McEwen Mining will spend a total of $17 million in exploration at the Black Fox complex with a goal to extend mineralization around known deposits, as well as testing new targets close to our mine and mill. The exploration program will focus on multiple targets within the Black Fox complex, including the Gray Fox, Froom, and Stock areas. These nearby targets are all associated with the Destor Porcupine Fault Zone, and with further exploration, may contribute to the definition of new mineralization that can extend the mine life at Black Fox. The stock and black fox deposits and the overall depth of our exploration targets are shallow when compared to other deposits and mines within the same favorable Archean host rock. The deepest hole at black fox is 1,050 meters, while mines in similar geological settings are at depths greater than one and a quarter miles. We will continue to drill our cluster of projects in the Timmins region, as they have all the right ingredients for making a new gold discovery. Hello everyone, uh, as Chris mentioned, my name is Bob McDonald, I'm the General Manager at McEwen's uh, Black Fox Operation in the Matheson area. Uh, just a couple of photos here from my family, uh, my wife Ursula, my daughter Anastasia, and uh, family, I think the thing that keeps us, uh, our passion is going to be about travelling and the photos reflect that. I just put a photo in also, our daughter is now a student at Western University and doing very well there, and we're very pleased, and she seems to be having the time of her life down there, so it's a big moment in our family. I think the video did a pretty good job of showing uh, the operation, but I just wanted to provide a few more comments on the operation. Uh, it's two discrete properties. The mill uh, is located about 14 miles uh, west of uh, Matheson. It's the old uh, stock mill uh, from that property. Uh, in the foreground, you can see our mill complex and then the tailings facility in the back. Uh, located seven uh, miles uh, east of uh, Matheson is the Black Fox mine site itself. And you can see in the photo there, the uh, it's the operation uh, background there. You can see our administration buildings and the portal to the underground uh, for Black Fox is sitting in the shadows of the pit. 
on the map, uh, you can sort of see the, the main the main ore body there. The historic production has come out of our black fox operation, but there are some satellite deposits on the mine site itself. Flanking the black fox deposit is the Froome deposit and the Tamrac, and to the south end is the property we're pretty excited about right now, and it's the gray fox operation. A couple of uh, comments on some of the operating uh, imperatives we worked on over the last nine months uh, with the, the mine life we have and the costs we had. We did we have focused on operational improvements as a key priority for the operation. Uh, to date, we've identified uh, 12, uh, $12.3 million worth of savings. That with uh, current production rates is about two, uh, $250. Uh, an ounce uh, once fully reflected in our operating costs and offset somewhat by some of the investments we have to make in the business. Uh, how we achieve that, it's worth a few comments. One is that uh, today, 12, sorry, 12 months ago, uh, the difference in the manpower between 12 months ago and today is around 46 people. That's realizing a savings of about $4.4 million in labor costs. We were able to also take a look at the underground equipment, identified 11 pieces of uh, surplus equipment, which we subsequently retired. That's going to save us about $1.7 million uh, per year. Uh, we've uh, worked on reducing contract services, try to do as much work ourselves, uh, try to find better, uh, better value contract services where necessary, and that's going to realize the savings of about $2.5 million a year. Our team was very focused on trying to make sure that we achieved, and we did achieve, hitting all five uh, global adjustment peaks for power draw in the year, which is going to significantly help our power costs moving forward, and we're going to realize the savings about $1.8 million there in the uh, second half of 2019 and into 2020. There are other, some other general cost savings that are about worth about $1.9 million. Uh, I think we, we're pretty happy with the progress we've made over nine months. We're not content that that's where we're going to end up as an operation, and we're continuing to identify and execute on other uh, operational improvements. Our second priority is converting resources into reserves. Uh, with the limited mine life, we want, uh, a key objective is to extend the mine life so that we can get the long-term benefits we see in the property. And with that, we also want to increase uh, operating mining flexibility. We want more stopes on the on, in line. We'll have less disruptions and irregularities in our production cycle. The key, the first aspect of that has been and is very much focused on near mine conversions, opportunities that we can convert into production within three to 12 months. There are some other production opportunities as identified by the satellites. We'll talk a little bit more about those. There's the Grave Fox deposit and the Froome deposit. Just a quick comment on the, uh, I did include the photo here, we, just a quick comment on there. This is our mine rescue team. They just competed uh, earlier this month and uh, they did fairly well. They won a couple of the competitions and come, come within a whisker of actually winning the provincials. Uh, what's, what's inspiring about this is that the all but about two people on this team have one or two years experience and at least one of the people had one month's experience so they're pretty enthusiastic. I thought they did an exceptional job and they, they, they've done us proud at the competition. Uh, what's highlighted here in the red, these are our active mining areas. Those are the areas we're currently uh, mining in. Uh, again, uh, so we've, we're, when we're taking a look at it, our second imperative is to extend the mine life, identify near mine resources that we can convert. And these are the targets that have been identified by our exploration and geology people. And it's based on drill results and looking at some of the historical information uh, from the operation. And I, we, we plan to be pretty successful here and we feel that we'll be able to extend the mine life in a very short order. Some comments on the deposits, as mentioned, Black Fox at the uh, beginning of, or sorry, at the end of 2018, consisted of 472,000 ounces at a, grade, at a grade of 7.7 .7 grams. In addition to that, we've had the Gray Fox, which is at the southern part of our property. It has a resource of 465,000 ounces at a grade of 6.6 .6 grams. When we take a look at that, there's a fairly big. Sounds like my phone. Uh, so that's a fairly critical, a fairly decent sized pr uh, property uh, deposit. It's attractive in terms of not only the size but the grade, and it's drawn our interest. The Froome deposit, it's got an it's a pretty good location. We can access it from an underground at the bottom of the uh, Black Fox pit, but it is a bit of lower grade and it is fairly modest in size. Historically, it's indicated that it's a marginal deposit. We will take another look at that, and uh, but it's not our our number one priority remains Gray Fox for development. 
the Gray Fox deposit, as mentioned, is 465,000 uh, ounces. Uh, it continues to be an active exploration project. Ken Tiley, our exploration manager, will speak to it in detail on what's going on from an exploration viewpoint. From a, an operational viewpoint, when we take a look at it, we can see that it's multiple structures. There's the contact zone, the south zone, and the area of immediate interest is the, the 177 zone, uh, 147 zone. When we take a look at it, historically, the work that was done on assessing this property identified it as an open pit. I think with the experience and the, and the uh, expertise that we have on the current management team and technical teams, we've st took a step back and we're reassessing this as potentially being an underground deposit. And we feel we can selectively mine it. There's some synergies that we can get from uh, the existing uh, uh, Gibson decline that's in play right now. And then we can also, coming off of that, we see that we have the opportunity to limit the amount of capital development required to access multiple deposits, which is exciting to us. With that, with that, I'll hand it off to uh, Jack uh, Henrik, our, our general manager at Goldbar. Thank you. Got to go back. There you go. The Gold Bar Mine is very well located on the prolific Battle Mountain Cortez Gold Trend in Eureka County of Central Nevada and only 25 miles south of Barrick's largest gold operations. Over 224 million ounces of production comes from Nevada and represents over 80% of the United States gold production. If Nevada were a country, it would be the fourth largest gold producer in the world. Gold Bar is a conventional hard rock open pit mine using traditional heap leach methods. Processing of the material involves ore being fed to the crushing plant using a front end loader, being crushed, agglomerated, and then transported to the heap leach pad by a series of conveyor belts. Power to the mine is achieved through natural gas generators and the all-weather road access is maintained by Eureka County. Gold Bar is McEwen Mining's latest mine to undergo construction and is approaching commercial production in the second quarter of 2019. Our inaugural gold production took place in the middle of February 2019 and recovery rates are directly in line with our 2018 feasibility study. We have estimated that Gold Bar will produce 50,000 ounces of gold in 2019, with all in sustaining costs of $975 per ounce. The 2018 feasibility study envisioned Gold Bar to produce an annual average of 62,000 ounces for six years. However, the 2018 expiration drilling has now extended the estimated mine life to 7.4 years. We expect that with additional drilling at Gold Bar and Gold Bar South, there is potential to continue to expand production even further. Our 2019 exploration budget on the property is $5 million and will include drilling beyond the limits of the current mine design, as well as testing for favorable Carlin-type mineralization at depth. The Gold Bar Mine holds all the right attributes for the potential to host a multi-million ounce gold deposit, given its location near a cluster of large Carlin-style deposits, as well as favorable geology and mineralization. We are excited that commercial production is just around the corner and to announce another successful operation at McEwen Mining. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Henris. I'm the uh, general manager at the uh, Gold Bar Mine in uh, Nevada. Um, just a quick uh, slide here to kick off a little bit about uh, my family. Um, I've got a wife, uh, two kids. Um, there's pictures of my wife and myself uh, in, uh, in Ireland uh, recently. Uh, my two kids, that's at the uh, Garden of uh, the Gods in Colorado. And then we have our extended family as well, which is our, our, four, uh, our four dogs. Um, and proud to say that three of them are our rescue animals. And my wife and I have been involved uh, with the rest of the family uh, for about 15 years in uh, uh, dog rescue. So a little bit about my career. Um, I uh, just recently joined uh, McEwen uh, at the beginning of May. Um, prior to that, I was with uh, Gold Corp. I was the vice president of mining and geotechnical. And prior to that, uh, I was with Newmont uh, for 12 years, a general manager at uh, their Carlin operations in uh, northeastern Nevada, as well as Cripple Creek and Victor uh, in Colorado. So I'm starting off the presentation with a few pictures of the site. Uh, you, you saw a bit of it uh, with the video, um, but I certainly want to walk folks through. Um, 
Right here we have our processing plant, uh, as well as our processing ponds to the right. Uh, we've got our admin building here. And then, of course, you can see heap leach right there. And you can see that, uh, as Chris spoke about, uh, we're actually loading. We loaded across uh, the south side, and we're loading up the east side as well. And you can actually see the operations, uh, the pit in the background. Uh, with the other picture, a little bit closer, uh, again, you can see the processing plant with the pond to the right. Again, our admin building. You can see a bit of the corner of the, uh, of the heap leach. And then, of course, our LNG uh, generators. So I'll talk a little bit uh, about operations. Um, currently, we're mining at about uh, 900,000 tons a month uh, with plans to ramp up to 1.5 million um, by late fall. Uh, our current fleet, uh, we're running 1,300 ton haul trucks, uh, ramping up during that time frame uh, to, uh, to 18 trucks to take advantage of the three uh, loading units that we have on site. As Chris stated, uh, the model uh, is performing well, uh, both on location uh, and volume. Um, but we are getting uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of a bump in grade, which is most helpful. The pictures uh, to the right. Um, this is the pick pit looking south. Uh, you can see a couple of our blast hole rigs, and we have a haul truck sitting uh, right there, uh, um, leaving the pit. Uh, and the picture down below, um, we've got uh, our survey crew um, staking ore for us. Um, so, just some pictures of uh, the activity that's going on at site. So we'll move on to process. Uh, currently, um, our crushing and stack uh, stacking production rates uh, through uh, mid-month were about 6,000 tons per day. Um, our commercial target of production is 5,400 tons per day, as Chris stated, uh, which is 70% uh, of our targeted uh, 7,200. We actually have plans in place. Um, we want to get to 8,000 tons per day through a series of continuous improvement projects. Several of those projects are, uh, are um, uh, projects that we've developed uh, as the learnings of operating the mine. Uh, the conveyor belt cover and the roof over the agglomeration drum are really weather related, uh, as Chris stated, very wet winter uh, in Nevada. And uh, we've learned, uh, as well as uh, we're going to implement a telescoping stacker and a rock breaker at the crusher. Um, in a later slide, I'm going to detail exactly what the benefits of uh, that work uh, is going is to bring to us. So quickly, mine production. Um, this graph shows by month um, actual and forecasted production for the rest of 2019 and 2020. What you can see clearly is uh, this spring into summer, there's a ramp up to about 1.5 million tons, as we talked about. That comes with the addition of some trucks to take advantage of the loading units. Um, but then we've also forecasted weather days, both in 2019, 2020, and for life of mine. Again, as we've learned, uh, running the operation at 8,000 feet in northern Nevada, there's, there's weather impacts. So we've accounted for those and potentially gives us some opportunity as we learn how to uh, run better in those conditions. And if we don't get a severe winter, potentially gives us some upside. Um, ounce production, uh, you see that, uh, again, this is actuals um, through April with a ramp up through the end of the year. As Chris stated, planning to be at 50,000 ounces uh, by year end. And then if we look at uh, 2020, uh, we ramp up to 80,000. And if you think of that, it makes perfect sense. Um, we, we, in 2019, we have to produce about 40,000 ounces in the last half of the month to hit the 50,000 for the entire year. So 80,000 is, is achievable for us. Quickly wanted to talk, and Chris hit on this as well, uh, quickly, quickly wanted to talk about the uh, uh, recovery curve. Um, we have in the green, um, we have the feasibility uh, recovery curve, which is uh, ultimate recovery versus time under leach. And the red line you can see is our actual performance uh, with the uh, first uh, cell uh, under leach, and it's performing uh, very closely to the uh, feasibility recovery curve. And as I stated earlier, I want to talk a little bit about the specific projects we have and what the impact to throughput at the crusher and conveying system will be uh, for the year. You can see that we're at about a base rate of about 6,000 uh, tons per day, and that's for uh, where we are currently in the month of May. Rockbreaker, we believe, will bring about 400 tons uh, per day. Uh, conveyor, 300. The agglomerator, the roof on the agglomerator, about 500. And um, the telescoping stacker will be 800. Uh, to, to ramp us up to 8,000, which is our internal target. 
Um, just to be clear, we're not going to increase the throughput. This is just these projects are going to increase uptime for us, so we'll have more time crushing. With that, uh, I'd like to turn it uh, back over to Chris. <coughs> Thank you, Jack. Well, I was so excited talking about my family and wanting to get into the presentation that I forgot to talk about briefly my, my career. Uh, just to give you an idea, I was graduated from Queens back in 1992, and then I went mine contracting for 15 years. I worked for Dynatech or DMC Mining with Bob uh, Dengler and Bill Shaver. Many in the room may know him, won't know them. And then in 2007, I transitioned over to the company side, and I went to work with Lakeshore Gold and then moved on to uh, a couple of smaller companies, and then Kirkland Lake Gold for two and a half years with George Ogilvy there back in 2014 through to late 2016. And I joined McEwen Mining in uh, last August, so I've been here for approximately nine months now. As I mentioned during my opening remarks, San Jose Mine is a joint venture between McEwen and Hochschild. We own 49%, and Hochschild owns the 51% and are the operators. The San, Homa, San Jose Mine is off to a great start for 2019 with a strong Q1 performance. The grades and recoveries have been slightly higher than planned, which is very positive, and they are on track to deliver on guidance in 2019. You can see the recoveries here, this being actual and that being budgeted. And you can see we're doing better than planned. A large focus in 2019 is on cost reductions. With the recent export tax implemented by Argentina, we're looking for ways to improve the profitability of the operation. So we've identified several cost-saving areas that we're moving on. So far, we've identified about $2.5 million in savings, such as the hydrogen peroxide consumption, looking at improvements in process control, and bringing work in-house rather than outside contractors or consultants. Last year, we invested in a hydraulic fill plant as well as a water, cover, water recovery plant, which was justified by a change in the mining method to utilize smaller mining equipment in captive areas. This will improve mineral recovery, reduce dilution, and save kilometers of capital development. You don't have to design drifts and ramps to access these captive areas to backfill. You can just run a pipe up the raise to access. Both are now operational, and the hydraulic fill plant is ramping up to full production as parts of the underground mine transition to the new mining methods. As you can see from this economic analysis that was done on the hydraulic fill project, it made a lot of sense to move ahead with this change. You're looking at an IRR of 40% and a 1.6 year payback. That's what I call a no-brainer. On the exploration front, the operations plan to spend $3.3 million on drilling in 2019. Not only are we further exploring the San Jose mine, but we're also drilling at Aqua Viva, sitting up here to the northwest corner, where they already have several mineralized structures identified. It is a very exciting area for us. The operation, as I mentioned before, has a solid track record of replacing ounces on an annual basis. And we are pleased with the mine's performance in the first quarter, and we're excited about the exploration potential on the property. I would now like to pass it over to our Senior Vice President of Exploration, Sylvain Godard. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sylvain Gerard. I'm the SVP Exploration. On the first photo there, uh, my time is mostly shared between family and work or work and family, uh, traveling and, and exploring for, for gold. Uh, a key component of, of our business and our work is people. And here it's an example of a, a workshop we had uh, recently in Nevada, uh, getting a, a bunch of uh, qualified people in the room sharing information and defining uh, best targets. Uh, personal uh, or professional background, I've been uh, in this industry for about 30 years. Uh, two years with McEwen Mining now. Uh, previous to that, mostly three large companies, um, Inmet Mining, Barry Gold, and Kinross. Uh, I work in, in many countries, uh, mostly North, South America, and, and also quite a lot in Africa. And uh, I had the, the opportunity to work on, on some uh, really large, uh, world-class gold system uh, in the world. Um, I will give you an introduction about our exploration programs, and then Ken Tiley, 
uh, we'll, we'll talk about Timmins and Bob Kastelik uh, about Nevada. Uh, the key points I want to make are that uh, we are focusing our exploration on three projects uh, that are very well located and provide uh, a real good upside exploration potential. Uh, you know, we talked about it in Nevada, it's Gold Bar, and in ABTB, Southern ABTB, it's Black Fox and Stock. In addition, our partner, or Archal Mining, is exploring at San Jose, Argentina, and managing a five million exploration program around our mine there. 2018 was uh, quite a positive year. It was our first year there in the ABTB at uh, those projects and reactivation in Gold Bar. And um, we, we generated results, significant results from all of our sites. And, and this year, we are following up on, on last year's success with uh, another major exploration program. Starting with the regional setting, and this is important where we are located, all of our projects are located along regional structure, highly endome, well mineralized structure, hosting hundreds of million ounces of gold, very large deposit plus 10 million ounces, often occurring in, in cluster forming the mining camps, the mining districts. As you can see, uh, this is the Destor Porcupine just east of Timmins here. And this area, it's our stock project. We have two projects in Timmins, stock and, and Black Fox. And there is a major structure, as you can see here, intersecting the Destor Porcupine exactly where the mine is located, or the historical mine at stock. If we keep going along the trend, there is a major flexure, change of orientation of the break right where Black Fox is located. And there is also a structure coming from the south, intersecting the, tr uh, the, the Destor Porcupine at, at the property. And many deposits occur on the property and along the, the, the structure to the south. So we are not just located along the Destor Porcupine, we are located on key segments of the regional structure where a lot of action, a lot of things happen and gold mineralization um, has developed and, and uh, it's a good place for discovery. Moving now to Nevada, again, we are located along one of the trend, the, the, the large trend in Nevada, the Cortez trend, just southeast of the Barrick uh, uh, district, uh, uh, Cortez district. There's 50 million ounces gold there, uh, very large deposit, um, regrouping in, in this area. If we extend from this sector, this is the Barrick sector there, along the uh, a major fault, the Cortez fault, that become the, the wall faults over our Gold Bar project. Gold Bar is down here to the south. Um, there is also a very special characteristic. You see this northwest-southeast trend. This is an alignment of intrusive, so there is a structure controlling that. That, that cut through the, the trend there. We have a similar situation here at Gold Bar. Again, we see those are key feature, key criteria, making those projects extremely well located for, for gold mineralization. Now we look at the local scale. Okay, we are well located along the trend. What about at property scale? We are working, exploring on proven gold system. Gold Bar has over 1.7 million ounces Gold and Doman, I mean here past production, current resource reserve, it's a global uh, Gold and Doman, significant size system. Black Fox has more than 2 million ounces. Stock, we got the first resource last year at the Stock East. This is only 700 meters from our mill. Um, and the historical stock mine stopped production 20 years ago at shallow depth, 330 meters. Um, and, and this, this remains uh, mostly underexplored as a project. Talking of underexploration, we believe that there is a lot of upside. Uh, there's upside at depth. Uh, here is an example of Archean Gold Deposit. You have the Red Lake ca Camp, Timmins, and Kirken Lake. As you can see, those mines uh, will extend to great depth, two kilometers, in, in many cases, and sometimes more. And same thing happened to other greenstone belt. Those Archean gold deposits go very deep. Um, here you have our project, Black Fox and Stock, and you can see the depth of those projects is still shallow for Archean gold deposit and open uh, in mineralization. At Black Fox, our deepest hole intersected 55 gram. At Stock, our deepest hole intersected 30 gram per ton. 
So those two systems are fully open and still have room to grow. Uh, same thing happened along strike. We have over 20 kilometers of strike land. This is shallow depth exploration, and Ken is going to talk in more detail about that. Again, Gold Bar is, is, uh, is an interesting project. It's a large footprint. Uh, we have a 12 by 6 kilometer uh, area that is mineralized around our pit and extension uh, on the property, but it's still a shallow system. Um, so there is grow potential there as well. And, and it's very important to, to keep in mind that in Nevada today, you have the big gold strike, the big Cortez, but all of those deposits started as gold bars, small, low grade, often heap leach open pit. So we believe that the, the upside potential there, it's, it's real, and, and we are going to evaluate this potential. I mentioned 2018, that was a positive year, and, and just here a few outcomes. Um, we replaced 70% uh, of the reserve ounces at Black Fox, and at Gold Bar, we added one year mine life. Uh, on the resource front, we added 300,000 ounces of measure indicated resources from uh, projects in Timmins and Nevada. In addition, we had uh, over 170,000 ounces of new and fair resources. And uh, I mentioned San Jose, we keep increasing there the unfair resources as well. In addition to that, you know, we uh, develop a lot of understanding about our projects, refine our model, um, generate uh, new targets, and, and, and generated a lot of new results, drill intersections, uh, and, and we are following up uh, and drilling on, on those ones right now. 2019 now, uh, basically, we keep following up. We had a lot of uh, material that we had a few drill intersections that we really have to, to keep drilling, so we are doing that. Uh, starting with Nevada, uh, we have the gold bar south deposit. That's 100,000 ounces gold at surface, so we want to convert this from resource to reserve to extend the mine life. Hopefully, we can get another year of mine life from it, uh, or even more. We'll also step out from our open pit area and test for a larger gold system, Carlin system at Gold Bar. And a portion of our program is, is directed to test the, ver the deep potential of the property for the large game changer, actually, uh, large Carlin gold system. So this is happening now. We started drilling uh, earlier this month. At Black Fox, we talked about the mine itself. So we drilled the west extension and the depth extension of the mine. Um, and we're also testing targets or following up on targets very close, proximal to existing resource. One of them is the Gray Fox uh, sector in the southeast of the property. Uh, two exciting targets uh, in, in, in this area, Gibson and 147 Northeast. We had a press release out just this morning um, uh, about those uh, recent intersection of those targets and uh, really a good place to keep growing our uh, uh, resources there. And at Stock, we have two mineralized zones, the mine and the Stockies that we keep exploring, and a three kilometer priority trend around the old mine. And San Jose, I mentioned that, we keep exploring around the mine. We have good track record there to replace resource reserve, and, and finding more um, high grade gold and silver mineralization. I will conclude by saying that, uh, you know, from my experience uh, working uh, a lot of gold system in many countries, I can see that our projects are of top quality based on local and also regional scale uh, criteria. Exploring proven gold system uh, located in some of the best regions in the world really uh, clearly uh, uh, improve our chance of success and, and, and discoveries. Um, 2018 was a, a pretty good exploration year, and we are working to make 2019 even better. Now we'll invite Ken uh, and Bob to talk about uh, in more detail our projects in Nevada, in Timmins and Nevada. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sil. Um, just to start off, uh, I'm an upbeat, optimistic exploration guy. You're going to hear that common theme throughout hopefully the next 15 minutes. Um, I came out of university in 1984 and went directly north to, uh, to the Timmins area. I've been there ever since. 
I've worked for companies such as Kinross and almost 20 years with Goldcorp and Placer Dome, uh, some smaller companies such as Lakeshore and Manita. Uh, but I've always remained in the North. I'm a huge fan of the opportunities for the North. Uh, my family's in the North for some reason. I'm starting to feel guilty, by the way. I don't have a picture of a dog on the screen. But uh, for some reason, uh, we're drawn to water in our spare time. Uh, Julie and I spent a lot of time in Manitoulin paddling on top of it. And my two kids race through it. Uh, my son, Matt, who's 14, is getting pretty good at it. He's breaking several records. And he's heading off to Calgary for nationals later in the summer. So I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so uh, talking about our opportunities at Black Fox and Stock. So as Sylvain mentioned, uh, we're ideally situated. We have two properties that overlie the regional Dester Porcupine Fault Zone. I don't want to get into a lot of detail. I'll try not to uh, go into too much Geology 101. But the key takeaway here is you need structural preparation. You have to have those cracks opening up. You have to have those voids forming so the late stage fluids that carry the gold can infiltrate into those openings and deposit the gold. The Dester Porcupine is renowned for that. It's a world-class gold camp. And uh, within the Timmins area, you have over 70,000 ounces. And if you just, if I can, just zoom into the, uh, the image here, just, just in this area here, 2 million ounces of production over the last 50 years. This is on a splay or a, like an offshoot or a fracture that feathers off the main structure. They come out like this. Okay, that creates the dilatancy that the fluids exploit. So I'm going to spend the next five slides talking about our Black Fox mine. This is a vertical section, like a slice through our ore body. And as you pro progress down through the open pit, heading towards the sort of the 300 area, meter level down towards the 740. And our ramp right now is here at about the 820 level, OK? The majority of the drilling that happened last year in 2018 was very successful. But the number one focus was converting resources into reserves and expanding the, re the resource categories, our confidence in the resources. Uh, there was a lot of sort of lingering uh, resources in the upper levels of the mine. So Riley and his drills worked into that area. You can see he generated quite a few encouraging, int interesting uh, assays. That's those triangles. But we were able to drill one or two long holes down into the depth extension of the mine. And this is the key one right here. OK, look at that. 55 grams over a meter and 1.2 meters. This is at the 1050 level, OK? Our ramp, our miners, or we're at the time, we're only at the 800 level. So 250 meters of opportunity there, right? This gave us lots of uh, inspiration for 2019. So this is what we've done so far. We're still focusing on uh, developing and growing our resources. We've had a rig, or sometimes two rigs, in this west ramp area, drilling under the 335 level, up into the 300 level. Look at some of those values. Look at this. 1175 over one meter. OK? We do have a drill here now on the 810 drill drift. We're filling in some sort of high definition drilling right in this area, outlining the near term expansion of the what we call the deep central zone. OK? Later in the year, we will be able to move the drill back further back into our drill drift and start heading to depth. And for the first time in probably three or four years, we have, or we hope we have, uh, the ability to excavate four new drill drifts. These are all on the west side of the deposit. Uh, they look essentially like, like hockey sticks, projecting out about 100, 150 meters. That's going to give us a great opportunity to test this western flank. These are those hits we had earlier in the year. By having these drill drifts in, now we can hit it perpendicular. We have a better attack angle. And we'll be able to get the holes down into this area and start thinking about long-term opportunity at the deep central. And you know, beyond 2020, 2019, we need to think about what our future is. We know there's values on the flanks. We just have to get in there and test it. We know there's a bad fault zone. We've lost some of our surface holes coming through like this. 
but we got to get some drills into here and head into this area. I would love, I would kill to be able to get a drill bay into here so we can test in these areas in here to see which plunge direction has the best opportunity for long-term growth. So now I'm going to spend uh, probably about five minutes talking about our short-term expiration potential. I don't know if you were here in September or not, but uh, 2018 was great. We increased our resources at Froome, at Tamarack, in the Gray Fox area. We also came up with sort of seven new drill intersections discoveries. Uh, this year, at least for the first five months of it, we're applying a lot of focus. We're staying in the southeastern quadrant of the property. It's about five kilometers from where our guys are mining, and it's mostly focused on what we call the Gibson Calor structure. This is one of those splays I was talking about earlier. This is where it looks. So right in this area right now, we have four diamond drills. If I can write a letter four, or number four, uh, in this area within a one kilometer radius. And as Bob mentioned earlier, there's existing resources there of 465,000 ounces. So this is what the area, when you zoom into it, looks like. Back last summertime, we were drilling some holes into the 147 area, and we hit a quartz vein. Here's a photograph of it. And it was looking really interesting. The values came back. We really took notice. Wow, 16 grams over three meters. We call these things crustiform veins. You see they have sort of this ribboned, ribboned sort of texture to it. Uh, we believe these are formed from this granitic sort of body that sits in here called the Gibson intrusion. And as the, the hot fluids were, were driving off it, as it was cooling down, the fluids were escaping along pathways off to the northeast. Well, we started hitting this vein rather predictably from section to section to section. And we were hitting them quite shallow uh, depths. So we went in with an excavator, exposed a little bit of the land, and sure enough, we could see these veins coming to surface. Uh, we now have two rigs focused right on the 147 Northeast, okay? Uh, here's a great photograph of what the core is looking like. Look how broken that is. This is almost like it's been fractured or blown apart by the hot, hot steam escaping from that intrusion. And that fine, fine, dusty quartz that's filling all those little cracks and voids, that's what brings the gold along. That particular sample ran 12 grams. And it was only 130 meters down hole. So you're looking at maybe 100 meters uh, below surface. So those two rigs that are in there right now, we're drilling on a pattern to uh, try and prove this up so we could possibly head towards inferred resources uh, that we can give to, uh, to Bob and his engineers. This is what it looks like again in a vertical slice through this target. Okay, so we've got 14 intercepts so far in an area that really is only 200 meters by 300 meters, right? Very close to surface. Could be relatively easy to, uh, you know, to, to get into, to, to touch and feel, as Bob mentioned, coming through some of the old former workings that date back to the late 80s. Also want to spend a minute or two talking about our second target in the area. It's called the, the Gibson sort of discovery. We call it a breccia, and I'll explain why in a minute. It's situated on the other side of the road, probably about 600 meters to the west of the 147. So last year, we were drilling down under some old historic workings from the late 80s where there had been some veins that had been exploited, and we let the hole run on. And we entered into an incredibly fractured and broken up run of uh, what we call cyanide. It looks almost like, uh, like, like granite. You can see this, this picture here. It almost looks like it's been milled and crushed. Well, you see all this sparkly stuff? This is all pyrite that came in with those mineralizing fluids. Again, the same theme. You have to have structural preparation. You have to have mineralizing fluids. The gold came with it. Look what it ran. 3.1 grams over 34 meters of core length. And within that, there was sort of a higher grade internal core that ran 10.8 grams. We found lots of VG, fine little spots in there in, the, in that fracture matrix. So needless to say, uh, we were thrilled by this. It, it sort of very quickly zoomed to the top of our priority. Back in April, when we started drilling, we put a rig into here, and this was the discovery hole. Well, we laid out a hole to go about 250 meters vertically below it. We drilled the first hole, it's number 1106, and boom, we hit. See all these elevated? These are gold values in here 
over about 60 meters, and they're right along the contact of that intrusion between the volcanics and the intrusion. Okay, look at the values that are coming back. 16.9 grams over 3 meters. and Also, 6.8 grams over 2 meters. So we installed the steel bypass wedge up hole to get a second cut from the, same, from the same path. And we were able to do a cut in here. Now, a lot of these assays, I don't know if you can see it on this scale, but you see the blue area. Those, are, those assays are out at the lab right now. But we rushed this one spot in here. And oh my God, look at that. 519 grams over 40 centimeters. And I'll show you what it looks like. So there it is there. You can see the nice visible gold along the fractures. And again, look how broken and crushed and structurally prepared it really is. In this particular spot, there was four occurrences of visible gold. And as I said, it ran 519 grams. This is all the key ingredients that you would want in a recipe for a large scale system. And this is hopefully our visualization of what a large scale system looks like. This is that upper old historic vein system in here. We were drilling down underneath it. This was our discovery hole last year. We drilled the first undercut. We drilled the second undercut. These circles, guys, they represent 200 meters in diameter, right? So just put that in perspective for scale. You're looking at a, a box here roughly of 500 meters by 800 meters in depth. We don't know where it's going. We don't know it's limited, but I can tell you we're going to drill a hole in here, 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 here. We're going to be there probably for the next four months, okay? Drilling holes at, again, 100 meter spacing and just trying to very quickly get a, uh, an idea of the volume potential. But you can see easily that if it continues to, to show gold values like we're seeing here, you know, 11 grams over a meter, 35 grams over a meter, or, or that 500 gram, we could build up ounces really quickly. So now I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about off to the, uh, to the west at our stock property. This is about a 20-minute drive from our mine site. Um, it saw a lot of production going on in the 80s and 90s. And again, it's ideally located. It overlies the path of the Dester porcupine. In this particular case, all the splays come off like this. Right? Lots of opportunity. The old Aquarius deposits there that Echo Bay tried mining. And... Uh, I'll show you what we've been doing there. This is the mine. As you can see, it's quite limited. Uh, a company called St. Andrew Mine there. But key to note, and this particularly in the shaft area, only 275 meters of depth. Over here off to the west zone, 330. I mean, that's just over 1,000 feet deep. We firmly believe it's wide open. There's no cross-cutting features. There's nothing to truncate it here or here. They did very little amount of drilling, like from other areas, so uh, we wasted no time in getting into there. This is a satellite image, a high altitude image, showing the mine. This is what we focused on last year. Three areas, probably within, oh, about two kilometers of the old, potent, the old original mine. You can see the tailings that we're adding to all the time. This is the, the mill operations where we process our ore. Okay, so we got a rig into the east zone and uh, started drilling it at close density at 25 to 30 meters apart. Uh, we were originally thinking a potential of like an open pit. Uh, and we also had a drill, trying to drill off to the flanks of that old historic deposit. And then we did start creeping into the center to try and hook them up. This is what the core looks like. Again, for I guess probably the third or fourth time, you need that structural preparation. It's a long-lived event of crack come together, crack, seal, crack, seal. And this is what you're seeing going on here with the quartz. And oh, look at all this nice pyrite in here. In this particular area, it's kind of hard to see, but there's 14 grains of visible gold. And uh, this section right in, in here ran over two meters, ran close to an ounce, 26.5 grams. This is classic uh, east zone material just next to the Dester porcupine that every geologist dreams of hitting. This is, again, one of these vertical slices through the deposits. The hot colors indicate higher grades, right? So right now, we've moved a drill into the stock east area. Last fall, we completed our very first ever resource calculation on that, came up with 150,000 ounces. So now we have a rig in here, and it's testing the limits of these higher grade shoots. And who knows, maybe they connect. Maybe they go like this. We don't know, we gotta drill. We gotta drill down plunge. We have to drill in here and try and build up some underground compatible 
uh, values. You can see we're getting things like 4.8 grams or 2.8 grams. Well, they have high-grade internal cores, 19 grams, 52 grams, okay? We also, through this, uh, through April, May, we've had two rigs drilling off sort of the flanks of the old historic stock mine. We're getting some encouraging values there as well. And this is what those values look, at that, look like. Down here, probably about uh, the 650 meter level. And remember, they only mine to about 330. This is 300 meters vertically below. And look at those nice big, again, with that heat mat, right? Some nice intersections. 5.6 grams over three meters. There's an internal higher grade section there, 30 grams over 0.8 meters. We're very infused. Most of the Timmins mines uh, have a long plunge length, narrow strike length, okay? Sometimes there's a little, some of the mines, or some of the, the stopes that I remember visiting at Hoyle Pond, they were on, the vein only ran for 100 meters, but it ran down. They're mining this now at Hoyle Pond well below uh, the 1,000 meter level now. Okay, long strike length, length long potential. And don't forget, that's just in the central core of the property. We have seven kilometers of strike length, okay, with hardly any drilling in it whatsoever. Later in the year, we'll free up a rig. We'll come into these areas. We may have to wait until November, December when the swamps freeze up, but these are primo exploration sites to go to. So just wrapping things up, 2018 was great. I'm hoping 2019 is going to even be better. These are real. I have the piece of uh, ore from the 800 uh, central zone mining block in my pocket. You can come see it later. Um, so just as a good example, we're improving the opportunities at the mine. This is certainly near term. And five kilometers to the south, we're focusing on this 147 zone. These are values that just came in over the past few days, almost 50 grams over 60 centimeters. From that, we're hoping to be rather predictable near surface vein that we call 147 Northeast. So that wraps it up for about me. I've got core on display out there. Please come by and have a look at it and I'll, uh, pass, the, uh, I'll pass the mic on to Nevada Bob. All right, thank you very much, Ken, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Bob Kostelik, the Chief Exploration Geologist in Nevada, and uh, I just did the math, and I've been working in exploration for 40 years now, it's hard to believe, and about 30 of those years have been in Nevada, mostly on, on Carlin-type deposits, which Gold Bar is one of them. And I was involved in uh, the discovery in a Mesquite project in Southern California for gold fields back in the 80s, and I worked at uh, Chimney Creek made discoveries there for gold fields in the uh, middle to the late 80s and now it's part of Twin Creeks mine and I've been working for McEwen since 2006 so that's like 13 years so, so uh, some pictures here of my my wife Karen and her grandchildren Sarah and Samuel are pride and joy and uh, we also like to travel and we recently went to Mexico to see the the winter migration of the monarch butterflies it was pretty spectacular and recently I was fortunate enough to uh, hold a freshly poured gold bar at our gold bar mine. So we'll get on to the presentation here. Exploration in Nevada for McEwen is currently focused nearly completely on gold bar. We, as you know, just started commercial production and now we've really got a face that we need to f find more reserves to extend the life of the mine, replace the reserves that we're mining. And we have a lot of great ideas and targets that we are currently wor uh, working on, and I'll share some of that with you now. We have shallow oxide deposits, uh, Sylvan referred to Gold Bar South. It's a resource of 100,000 ounces right at the surface, and we need to drill that to bring it into a reserve status, so we'll be doing that this year, actually next month. Uh, there are other areas where there's oxide mineralization found by previous operators on the project that we are going to be evaluating and drilling and seeing if we can bring some of that into, into a reserve status or resource status. We'll be extending uh, targets that we, from ex extending from the known pits, from the known mineralization, we'll be looking down dip and extensions away from the current deposits. And we also have deep targets that would be possible game changers, the deep, high-grade targets similar to what are being found elsewhere in Nevada. And we're very excited about those too. So moving on here, a couple of, this is a location map of, of Gold Bar sitting right here. You can see that it, 
is uh, along the, the Cortez Fault, this black dashed line, is a very significant fault because all of the gold deposits lie along the fault. And at Cortez, the, the, the group of deposits there is, is there for a reason. It, the gold is not everywhere along the Cortez Fault, and it's grouped in specific areas for a number of reasons, one of which are the intrusions that Sylvain alluded to earlier. And we see the same thing at Gold Bar. We have a group of intrusions, or belt of intrusions, along underneath Gold Bar. There's some significant similarities between Gold Bar and Cortez, where there are 50 million ounces. One, uh, one of them is that they, each of them have a large footprint, a large surface footprint, and which was initially found by shallow oxide uh, pits and deposits. The host rocks are virtually identical between Cortez and Gold Bar. They're shallow water slope facies, limestone. They're, they're a type of limestone, the same formation, the same age at both, both districts. The intrusions we mentioned, major faults, the, the Cortez fault, and there are also parallel faults and cross-cutting faults that are also very important structures, critical just like it is up in the Timmins district. And we also see dome structures in both districts, which help to localize and focus the gold in what makes ore bodies. We have a, um, the, quite a, gold, a good gold endowment at Gold Bar, and uh, we are, have a lot of plans to improve that. This chart I wanted to share with you is from Francois Robert of Barrick, and it, it, it looks at 468 deposits around the world that are greater than 3 million ounces. So the yellow, the yellow bars represent a number of deposits of de different deposit types that are greater than 3 million ounces. So I wanted you to focus here on the Carlin type deposits of which Gold Bar is an example. There are roughly 20 de Carlin type deposits that are greater than 3 million ounces. Of those 20, nearly half, 45% of those are greater than 10 million ounces. Carlin type deposits have the largest proportion of big or giant, if you will, 10 million ounce plus deposits. So we are really excited that we are working on a Carlin type deposit and we are getting, we already have 1.7 million roughly and as an endowment ounces of gold. We're more than halfway to our 3 million after which point we almost, it's a coin toss whether we could get it to 10. So we are very excited about the potential just based on this statistic. Another statistic is showing the discovery depth of gold deposits in Nevada over time. And uh, starting in about 1980, uh, before 1980, all the discoveries were very shallow and near surface outcropping deposits, very easily discovered, easily to mine. And starting about 1980, companies were exploring deeper. And as you can see with time, the discovery rates or discovery uh, of deposits actually got uh, greater and greater depths, including even today, the latest discovery that Barrick has at Four Mile is one of the deepest Carlin type deposits yet known. So there seems to be no limit to the depth of which these things can be found. Uh, 2018 was a good year for us too at Gold Bar. This map shows in blue the gold that was known before 2018. This was modeled from previous drilling that McEwen did as well as uh, predecessor companies. During 2018, we added these yellow bodies here. We added 39,000 ounces to the reserve, or about a year to the mine life. You can see we drilled mostly the northern part of the Gold Pick deposit and at Gold Ridge, and we added 174,000 ounces to the resource, again about a year to the mine life. And we were focusing on defining the edges of the ore body last year. We pretty well did that. Now we're looking a little beyond that to look for extensions of the, the deposits down dip and a depth and a long strike. Again, I wanted to see the overall trend here of these deposits. They're lined up along this northwest trend, very similar to the alignment of the intrusions that we saw uh, in the previous slides. Focusing in a little closer to the gold bar, or on the whole gold bar property here, um, the gold pick pit is right here. Gold Cabin Creek is where we're currently mining in these two pits, and we have a third resource or reserve that we'll be mining later called Gold Ridge over in here. And we, in addition to that, our work has identified multiple exploration targets throughout the project, 
beyond the pits. You can see these target areas are all over the property. But again, even those target areas are aligned along this northwest trend. Down here at Gold Bar South, we'll be talking about this in a little bit, this is the outcropping resource of 100,000 ounces that we are going to bring into reserve by additional drilling this year. And oh, uh, I wanted to point out where next picture is going to be, the photograph is going to be well, standing right here, looking down this direction toward Gold Bar South, just to give you orientation. So we're standing in the Gold Pick Pit, where we're actively mining. You see the blast hole rigs here and the haul trucks. And, and we're looking now toward Gold Bar South here in the distance, about five miles away. And, and you can also see the exploration targets that are located along this trend, just to give you an, a sense of where, where they are. Now we've developed a mineralization model based on all of the geology, geophysics, all the information that we could possibly muster. And this is a cross section now looking from the wall fault here and on the west over to the Cabin Creek area. And this cross section here shows the ore deposits in red. The Cabin Creek are currently mining. We're mining a gold pick and we will be mining at Gold Ridge. And these are known occurrences of gold here out in Pot Canyon. This is that shallow, some shallow surface mineralization that we are going to be exploring. And these yellow areas are our targets that we've identified. Now the model, as we've drawn it, as we currently envision it, shows these steep faults, like the wall fault here in the west, and the red arrows are showing the fluid flow, or the, the way the gold came up these faults, found favorable layers in the stratigraphy, and flowed out into them and deposited gold. We see that the came up Cabin Creek Fault flowed up here along favorable beds called the Macaulay Formation, which I'll refer to later, and it mineralized the Gold Pick Deposit and the Gold Ridge Deposit. It also came up and mineralized Cabin Creek along several, there are multiple faults that are mineralized. I'm just showing the major ones here. This has resulted in shallow deposits. All of the production has been from the shallow deposits uh, to date. All the resources are in the shallow deposits, but it also shows us now that we have targets at intermediate levels and also deeper levels. This is one of our deep target areas in here. We have favorable host rocks down here right next to the wall fault. We're planning a, a, a hole that will penetrate down into this area. We also have another one planned for over in here to test the Cabin Creek fed mineralization here on the east side. Oh, yeah. the, next, the next slide is going to be focused into this target area here, which we call Gold Pick East or Gold Pick Down Dip. It's Down Dip extension of the Gold Pick deposit. And we'll zoom into that right now. So this is showing the, the historical drill holes. And this is the, the pit that will be mined at Gold Pick. It's being mined now. This is the ultimate planned pit. And these colored, this colored cross section here is a resistivity map. And what resistivity measures is the, the conductivity, basically, of the rock. And limestone, unaltered limestone, will give you uh, just patterns like these red, uh, purples and pinks and blues. And so it's very resistive rock. Where there's alteration in the rock and clay gets formed, the resistivity goes down and you get these colors like these uh, light greens and light colors. That, this means low resistivity. Something caused that low resistivity. It could be alteration. It's suggestive that it is because there's a drill hole here that had 1.8 grams over 10 meters. It stopped in this mineral in mineralization here, and it was in this geophysical anomaly. There's been no other drilling here. The favorable host rocks, the Macaulay Formation, continues down through here, and it's not been drilled. This is a, a prime exploration target for us. The Cabin Creek Fault bringing up fluids, hitting the favorable stratigraphy, and flowing out along bedding and depositing gold is our model for this target. Next one is, okay, this is an index map here that shows you where we are. Gold Pick Pit is here, Cabin Creek Pit is here. Zooming in on this map, we can see the Cabin Creek Pit where we're currently mining right here. About 300 meters north, there we drilled a hole just this month. And there's no other drilling around there. We drilled a hole based on the surface anomaly and a geophysical anomaly. Here's a cross section showing the same type of resistivity survey. We have a low resistivity feature here. We drilled a hole to intersect that and we hit some gold right in here. We hit a fault right here. This mineralization is coming up the fault, the same pattern that we see on the, on the master section. 
sh and coming up here and mineralizing favorable stratigraphy right in here. That the hole we drilled is in black. We're planning to drill these blue holes uh, as a follow-up and to further test this target area here to the east. Pot Canyon. Okay, this area is out on the west of the trend. Here's, here again for reference is Gold Pick, Cabin Creek, and Pot Canyon is out farther to the west. This is where I was telling you we had uh, historic holes that drilled shallow oxide mineralization right at the surface. I'll look at the cross section first. You can see these uh, faint little colored holes here. Those are the historic holes that hit mineralization 1.1 grams over 42 meters, starting at the surface. 0.6 grams over 18 meters, right at the surface. And the holes stopped. They just drilled through the mineralization and quit. We know that the Macaulay Formation, which hosts Cabin Creek and Gold Pick, lies underneath here. It didn't get drilled. We're planning to drill with these blue, these blue lines are our proposed drill holes. The wall fault we model is bringing mineralization up into these favorable beds. And there's also the Roberts Mountains host down here. The Roberts Mountains formation we know exists underneath Gold Bar. This is where our deep target would be hosted in, the high grade uh, uh, deep target, deep um, material that we're hoping to, to find is, would be hosted in this material here at depth, right next to the wall fault. So we have three stacked targets in one area here at Pot Canyons. So we're very excited about that. The map view shows, again, these are the historic drill holes uh, in the hot colors uh, and the warm colors. Uh, shows you where they were located. There's very little drilling around those to close them off. We're planning a, 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 a program of short hole drilling. Uh, that's here on the cross section. You can see these uh, short holes here. We'll be testing the shallow mineralization. A couple of deeper holes to test the intermediate one and then one deep hole to test the the deep potential. Moving now to Gold Bar South, again our resource, 100,000 ounce outcropping resource. And a cross-section view of Gold Bar South, this is our planned pit, the preliminary pit that is preliminary design to mine this outcropping mineralization. What's exciting to us, here's another resistivity map. We have these areas of resistivity low right in here, and here, and here that lie underneath, directly underneath this oxide, shallow oxide deposit, never been drilled. These are very exciting targets because this could, could be caused by faults that were bringing mineralization up into the shallow deposit. So we're excited about the potential there too, as well as converting these resources on the surface into reserves for short-term uh, for short-term uh, planning for mining. Let's see, here we go. So just to conclude, we've developed our geologic model, mineralization model. It seems to be working for us. We're applying it to our new drilling, modifying it as we need to. Our plan this year, as soon as we get, uh, basically in June, we're gonna start drilling at Gold Bar South to convert these resources into reserve. And we'll be drilling our extensions of the known deposits, uh, such as the one at uh, Gold Pick East and we'll be drilling a couple of holes to test the deep potential, and that will all be done this year. So I'll leave you with this picture on the right. It shows a drill rig drilling gold pick. If you took that picture today, you would see a pit there. So with that, I will turn it on over to Donald. Thank you very much. Turn it on. Yes. Thank you, Bob. Um, my name's Donald Brown, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Projects with McEwen Mining, specifically focused to our large copper project in Argentina, the Los Azules project. Here you see my high-flying family, and um, they like to travel. We're Stonehenge there in Segovia in Spain. Um, we've been doing this since they were little. It's getting a little more complicated these days. Um, my two daughters there, Fiorella and Alessandra, and their mother, Annette. And um, they're now at school in Great Britain. And you have me there on the right on the frontier between Chile and Argentina, um, the post that's been installed at Los Azules. They have aspirations to do the same high-flying thing there at some time. <laughs> so um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm now 40 years out of university working in mining and metals. Um, worked for many years with Bechtel, 
um, doing project delivery or project uh, a turnaround. I then went to work with Glencore, uh, again doing project delivery and my reward for a successful project delivery was to be sent to Las Bambas in Peru where undoubtedly it was project turnaround. Um, I've now been almost three years with McEwen Mining and focused to Los Azules and here I was given a blank sheet of paper and uh, with my many years of experience we're putting them to very good use developing a very optimal project here. Los Azules, perfectly located, um, great company there, uh, many of these very large resources in this part of the world, um, many of those um, on that map in production for many number of years. Um, just to the south of Los Azules there you see El Pachon, um, a project that I'll mention later and which has um, all the same kind of challenges that we have at Los Azules. Um, the project site itself, um, here you have a panorama view. Um, it might look um, like it doesn't show that much apart from arrows, but uh, there are some hidden attributes here in, in here. Um, here we have a tailings dam, and the tailings dam is the boundary between the contacted environment this way and the non-contacted environment that way. All of this area to the left here all drains naturally towards the tailings dam. So the tailings dam environmentally seals the Los Azules project footprint. And if you also look at the size of the footprint, it's very, very small. So this footprint that we have developed at Los Azules is extremely cost efficient, very environmentally secure. And just um, by way of mentioning uh, tailings dams, our tailings dam is an extremely secure structure designed for high seismic zones and nothing like those you've been reading about recently. Um, if Los Azules was a producing mine today, um, the 2017 PEA, um, what production we predicted in there would make Los Azules the 26th largest producer today. More importantly, it would be a lowest cost quartile producer. Now, there's many people here in the gold space. The production we're forecasting is more or less equivalent to a million ounce per year mine. But with a mine life that we're forecasting at Los Azules, which is you know, upwards of 35 years, there's no reason the production could not be higher. With our PEA, we provoked the interest of analysts. Goldman Sachs, in particular, last year put out uh, an appraisal of Los Azules. Um, these numbers here are spectacular for the copper space. And well, the word we use is compelling financials. Why well, it's so compelling, why isn't it happening? Why haven't we got a hole there? You don't have to be too uh, worried about that. There's plenty of challenges to put people off. Remoteness, no infrastructure, and the country challenge of Argentina. There are three big negatives that people see as a reason not to invest. Our focus over the last few years, I'm sorry, over the last two years, has been to get rid of those negatives. And um, we want Los Azules to advance to development. We know that to do that, we need to get the development to be straightforward. By doing that, it will become more attractive for investment, more marketable, and more valuable for shareholders. Now, for us to achieve those outcomes, we're going to go into project de-risking. And since the 2007 PEA, for the last 18 months, we've been working on these four elements of project de-risking. There are no others. Community in particular, you need to get the social license. We have to get the main EIA permit, or DIA as it's called in um, uh, Argentina. Um, we need project infrastructure solutions that deliver us great outcomes. And we need to get all of our legal easements and agreements all sorted. Get rid of these challenges that you see here repeated. So 2017, after the PEA was published, this was our situation at Los Azules. Just there you see Los Azules. And there's only one line going to Los Azules, apart from the border between Chile and Argentina. 
and that is a very uh, uh, poor quality access track with numerous switchbacks um, crossing um, two very high mountain passes, 4,400 metres. Um, these block with snow uh, very quickly, they're very hard to maintain open. We can really only rely on four months of access per year. If we're lucky, we can stretch it. This year, it was four months. Just into May, the snow started. Inevitably, the power solution, there's a power line, you can see it sort of heading down. Um, that would have to come up our road so we could build it. That would also have to cross those 4,400 metre high passes. It was never going to be reliable. It would have been down every time there was a major snowing and icing event and it would have been very difficult to bring back up again. None of this was conducive to development. On the Chilean side, you can see there a gap, there's nothing. Um, we know we wanted to get to Puerto Coquimbo, but we certainly didn't have any defined solution. We just had the aspirations. Now if I move forward to where we are now, Los Azulis has got a few more um, interactions with infrastructure. We developed a new solution for access. This is this red line here. It comes from an unpopulated point that connects to a road that comes from San Juan. So from San Juan to Los Azulis with this road here, which we call the Northern Access, we don't pass through any community. We don't even pass a house. We have uh, re-examined a large, broad valley at Los Azulis and done some simulations, and we have established that it's possible to put in a runway at Los Azulis. With the new northern access, the power line needs to follow that power line, that um, access road. You can see here that it goes underneath the power line. So we will intersect that power line. There's already a substation at that location recently created by a photovoltaic farm. And we will take that power line into Los Azules. It's going to be below the snow line. It's not going to be high altitude. It's going to be a robust power solution, very cost effective to construct and very simple to maintain. We've also created a legal easement over a very rudimentary track that was recently improved by some exploration um, companies this year um, to link to that mine help, that uh, resource help Ashon to the south, which has all the same challenges as us, the no power, the no access, and the no port solution. So there's potential for integration and cost sharing at some point in the future. On the Chilean side, the border pass was agreed to uh, to be opened uh, about two weeks ago with the Argentinian authorities and we are literally expecting an outcome from the Chilean authorities as soon as next week. The logistics route between Los Azules and Puerto Coquimbo, we've examined every single valley here in the high Andes and we've come up with this solution here that you can see. Um, the area here is three landowners they're delighted that we want to put a road through their land. Some of them haven't visited their land for more than 10 years because there's no access unless you're going by horse. The remainder of the logistics route, this section here, we have to make an a, a agreement for a regional road upgrade with the um, authorities of Montepatria. Um, everybody's very, very positive about this. We have all the drawings produced uh, for the legal easements and have a group of lawyers in Santiago working on this right now. The port of Coquimbo recently lost Mitsui, who had a mine uh, being exported through the port of, port of Coquimbo. They're delighted that they could have another customer. They've got all the facilities from Mitsui sitting there, the shipload of the storage sheds. They've got all the permits. And here we are knocking on the, their door. They can't believe it. It's just brilliant. So I'd like to go back to the northern access because it's so transformational for Los Azules, going from four months access to all year access. Um, finding this sort of solution at this stage um, is completely transformational for the ability to develop the project. We've already got the legal easement. We've already got the construction permit. I had the pleasure of being out on horseback for the best part of a month with a group of support people and verifying the on-ground situation as being completely viable and constructible. 
I can tell you there are definitely no higher altitude passes and it will be open all year. And as I mentioned earlier, there are no communities af um, affected by this road. The power transmission line that's going to be alongside is the robust solution. And we presently have this road out for pricing with contractors and with luck we'll be doing this work later next year. Point of this is you can no longer consider losses of this to be suffering from remoteness. As I mentioned, I was out there on horseback. Um, you can't see there's another, there's the rest of the team are up there. <laughs> um, there's one of my colleagues there. Um, the route's essentially um, a riverside route for the first half and for the second half it's over hillsides and down valleys. Here's a more um, distant view and I've put in what I see as the probable uh, route of the road in red and you can see there where the transmission line would be. It's hardly challenging. This is a uh, design. This design's been um, developed and it's been simulated by Lockheed Martin. Um, we know this airstrip works, works. We know we have no problem whatsoever um, escaping over these hillsides or landing in from that side. We have a thousand meters of margin in terms of altitude. The main thing here with this airstrip, look at this. One hour flying time from San Juan. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's just just next door, go down the airport, an hour later you're on the ground. It replaces eight hours of driving. But think of that eight hours. You get up in the morning, you drive for eight hours to Los Azules, you're not going to do anything. The first thing you're going to do is go and spend the night there and you'll do some work in the morning. This is a complete game changer for operations and development phase. We'll be able to operate a fly-in, fly-out work roster where people... Work, turn up at the airport in the morning and go to work and then spend maybe the next two weeks, three weeks there. And then when they finish their work shift, they go to the airport and a couple of hours later they're at home. It completely changes everything. Most important, of course, environmental permitting. If we don't have an EIA, as it's often called, or as uh, mentioned in Argentina, a DIA, you know, the project doesn't have permission to happen. So we have been working the last 18 months doing all of these things that have got ticks. These last two, they're all due to happen in the remain remaining part of this year. But look at this, major milestone. We will be getting a permit, or we believe we will be getting a permit next year. So a situation summary. Tangible solutions developed. Remoteness, I've said that's no longer applicable. We have a new access road. We have a, a defined power line. We have an, a runway. We've got the logistics through Chile sorted out. We have a term sheet with the Port of Coquimbo. All the infrastructure solutions that we need. In Argentina, it's often seen as very negative. But it's, it's a pro-mining government at national level. It's a pro-mining government at provincial level. And the local community, which has recently had a mine closed upon them and just earlier this year, is really pro-mining. The inflation rate, which frequently makes the headlines in overseas newspapers, almost all of our costs are US-based. The only inflation this project will feel is US dollar inflation. That doesn't mean to say that there isn't some kind of country risk there in Argentina. So our vision of where we want to be, where we plan to be at the end of next year, Significant asset value accretion. All of these things we want to happen and we believe are going to happen. We're going to receive our permit. We will have constructed the Northern Access Road. The airstrip runway will be commenced. Any remaining legal easements that we haven't got, we'll have by then. The Chile logistics route and exporting port will all be approved. And it's going to be approved long before the end of 2020. And with all of this, it's inevitable. We will achieve this. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Miguel. I am uh, Miguel Barahona. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, the general manager of Project Phoenix in, in Mexico. I want to share just a, a quick uh, pictures from my family. I have three kids, my wife, 
and I also include a dog on the family. This picture I take every year, I take the, in the same spot with my kids carrying in my shoulders, and this year they include an extra weight of the little dog on top of that. <laughs> oh, something, uh, just quickly, uh, so about my, my career, I'm a mining engineer. I've been uh, all my life uh, related with mining. I come from a mining family in Mexico. I've been working in South America, well, in uh, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, Peru, uh, BHP Tintaya, for some junior companies in terms of exploration, doing consulting. I work also in uh, Australia with a con contract mining company named TIS, based in Brisbane. So I've been uh, all over the place and trying to do something. With, with mining. And I'm very pleased to just recently join the excellent team, wonderful, and it's fantastic team, uh, McEwen Mining. I just have six months uh, uh, that I joined the company, and it's a very exciting moment for, uh, for being here. Uh, just uh, a little bit to let you know what's happening in, in Mexico. You know El Gallo Gold that uh, started producing from 2010 to 2018, produced 286,000 ounces of uh, equivalent ounces of gold. Uh, 2018 started uh, producing with residual leaching, and from January to April uh, 19, uh, it produced 7,300 uh, ounces of gold uh, equivalent from the residual leaching. Uh, as May of 22nd, that means until yesterday, we have. 313 days without lost time incident. That's very focused on, on safety, this uh, property. The property, as uh, I mentioned, is located in the state of Sinaloa. It's well known for uh, epithermal uh, deposits with high silver and high, grade, high gold. Um, let me show you where Del Gallo is located. All the production I mentioned came from here, this Del Gallo gold. And you have eight kilometers to the north, you have El Gallo Silver, and you have another deposit, which is Carrizo Lejo. And then you have on the south, you have another deposit, which is El Encuentro, which is gold. And you have another one that is Palmarito. Uh, there are some other areas that hasn't been explored, but it's potential in, in here. But uh, as you can see, this uh, operation is reaching the end of uh, the mine life. And Obviously, McEwen is very interested to extend the life of this operation because it's, uh, well, you have the resource, you have the people, and you have the infrastructure, and it makes sense to, to look for a business uh, continuity in here. Um, that's what I call Phoenix, and I think this is a proper name for name this, this project. I mean, it's coming from the end of life of the mine to restart uh, production. And from that point, uh, McEwen started doing a preliminary economic assessment. It was issued in 2018. And currently working on the feasibility study to be issued uh, next month, in 2019. As uh, Chris mentioned, this is based on phase one to reduce the capital investment, to just uh, reprocess the heat bleach uh, material that it was uh, existent, and to include in phase two El Gallo Silver, Carrizalejo, Palmarito, and El Cuentro. Those satellite uh, um, deposits or resources that are near the mine. Which uh, results from the preliminary economic assessment uh, for Phoenix, it gave a long life of uh, 12 years on the mine. It was a low capital investment of 71 million. MPB at 5% gives 60 million. After tax, internal rate of return 28%. This is a payback of uh, around four, four years for the investment. That involves, uh, includes an uh, input tailings storage. I'm going to talk about a little bit more in the detail. And obviously, it has exploration potential with some other that can easily go for over 12 years. Uh, the resource, uh, measure and indicate a resource, we're talking about 563,000 gold equivalent ounces and for an average annual production of 47,000 of gold equivalent ounces. It's, a, it's the estimated that comes from the PA. As you can see, it's 60% uh, silver and 40% gold. The location of the processing plant is obviously in the center, where you have on the north El Gallo Silver, and you have also Carrizo Lejo, 
which are silver deposits, but also you, can, you have in the south El Encuentro and also Palmarito. Those deposits are open at depth, hasn't been explored uh, consistently, so it has potential also for developing more resources. This is how it looks right now, the Samanio pit. This is the area where we're planning to use as a backfill. I took that picture just before I came, so it's very recent. And this is just an schematic view how it looks now. It's a render. This is when the pit is full, and this is when it's reclaimed. Uh, this, uh, the benefits of using this system, it's, it's been a challenge to get the permit for, for this uh, kind of uh, uh, storage of tailings, because it's one of the very first ones used in, in Mexico. Obviously, the advantage of that or the benefits is you minimize the impact on the surface landscape, so you don't leave a footprint. And just changing to this, uh, to this system, we're talking about 399 uh, hectares that will not, be, will not be affected. It's gonna, we're gonna, not going to leave a footprint on, on, the, on this. Uh, it comes from, from the area of the pit and also for the area that we were planning to use for uh, tailings dam and also for the leach path that is going to be reclaimed. This maximizes the use of uh, water in the system and this is very important. This is the safer method of storing the, the tailings. You know all the failures that uh, is happening worldwide like in, in Brazil or any other places. I mean when you have a lot of uh, casualties and, and damages and environmental risk, this is a safe uh, method to store tailings. Also, it has a lower the cost of the operation. Uh, where we are now is we have co completed 85% of the feasibility study. Uh, as any other project has challenge in terms of permitting and, and, uh, and uh, say infrastructure. Environmental permit has been uh, sent to the authorities and uh, we're waiting for a response of the on the uh, third quarter of 2019. Water rights has been granted. Power supply is feasible and is per permitted. Howlett Road, it's, uh, it's good relation with the communities has been, uh, uh, I mean, they, they agree on that. And this is uh, the existing infrastructure that is in place. We have the ADR plant here, we have the ponds, we have the crushing plant, and we have the uh, how you say the leach pad here. So this material is going to come here, crush it, and get to the new plant. Some achievements that we have now on, on the Phoenix project, the drilling has been complete, metal testing has finished uh, to define the resource, and the processing plant and the, the engineering, you see here is the leach pad, and here we are uh, with a new uh, system. Thank you. I'm going to pass this to Andrew Wanting, which is the vice president of uh, finance. I'm, I'm abbreviating this because we have an annual meeting starting in about 10 minutes, and uh, we've gone a little over time. Hope you found it useful, and perhaps I could ask all of you to put your hands together and just uh, in applaud the progress of all of the team. Um, before, and I don't think we'll have much time for questions and answers, but we will, we're going to have an annual meeting. It's going to run really quickly. It's just going to be the formalities, and if you want to stay, then we can have the question and answers then. I think that'll be a convenient way of dealing with it. But um, I'd like to, just before getting into our annual meeting, I'd like to talk about exploration. For, for me, that's been an enormous driver of value. And the rich high-grade discoveries at Red Lake um, became the engine that drove Gold Corp. It with, drove the spectacular share price performance. Uh, it's important to understand that Gold Corp began as a struggle, uh, very much like Black Fox was when we bought it and is today. Um, when I began building Gold Corp, Red Lake, the Red Lake mine was a high-cost mine. It had short life, was expected to close in three years. Um, it had a very 
long history of troubled labor relations. It hadn't had any money spent on exploration, but it was right next door to a, a rich mine. Um, and I thought there was some opportunity there to explore. Um, we had to change the attitude of the workforce, um, which resulted in a labor strike that meant we had no revenue for 46 months. We had no production for 46 months. Um, gave me a death threat as well. Um, the price of gold was falling and we retired debt. And when we started exploring, we went out aggressively. And we found something there that um, in so many ways reminds me of Black Fox. Uh, because Black Fox had it, when we bought it, short life, year and a half, it was high cost, um, an unmotivated workforce, and it had a reputation in the market of not having served the two previous owners very well. Um, so let's go back to Gold Corp for a moment. It took five years before we got that discovery from the time I bought control of that company. So it doesn't happen overnight. But when we made the discovery, it w there were nine holes with an average, and the average grade was 30 times greater than what we were mining at the time. So the average amount of gold per ton was 30 times the grade. And that average was nine ounces per ton over an average width of eight feet. So that's equivalent 280 grams over two and a half meters. Now, when I look at the exploration results we put out today, and they, on the face page, there were five results which were rich, high-grade gold. Um, just to give you a sense, the average grade of those five is 4.9 ounces per ton, or 152 grams per ton. And it was over 6.23 feet, or the better part of two, two meters. So the grades, a little more than half of what Gold Corp had, and the widths are good. Now, when we went back into production after the strike at Red Lake, we went from producing 50,000 ounces of gold to 500,000 ounces of gold a year. And the cost went from $360 an ounce to $60 an ounce. Now, I can't help but think there may be a possibility that maybe Black Fox is another red lake, not only with the grade, but there's a chance to increase the production. We have a um, big exploration program going on this year. $17 million will be spent on the Black Fox property, and there's going to be news coming out along the way. We were a little slow coming out with news so far this year. Um, <laughs> we had a little covenant, loan covenant we had to get over at the end of March which caused us to have to do a financing, but um, we're fully funded, ready to go through. And Andrew's going to talk about it at the annual meeting when we start. <laughs> so, and that start is in five minutes. So uh, I can entertain a question or two right now, then I can invite you to stay to the annual. And it, I can tell you it's we're experimenting. Last year, we had a very fulsome annual meeting. We went through the formal part, and then we had presentations such as we've just had now. So we're going to try to run through the formal part quickly, because there's not much on the agenda. And I should say that for any of you that have just come in the room and wanted to get um, information on any of our operations, that the session that's just gone on since 2 o'clock today it has been um, recorded and will be up on our website. So you can have that. It'll have an index in it, so if you don't want to sit there for a couple of hours, you can just break it down into pieces. So, are there any questions? Recognizing I'm going to cut you off soon. Yes? One of the best presentations I've ever seen, uh, and uh, you know, I think everybody here that uh, appreciates it. Uh, the, there, there are a ton of questions, but for example, on Los Azules, uh, you know, are you going to be trying to get uh, ore out? It, it's early days, so you don't know. On the uh, to the west, or are you going to go through Argentina? And where are the actual uh, the, the pits and the openings? I wasn't entirely clear. Are they all on the Argentine side, or are they on both sides? The property is all on Argentina, and we have an agreement with the governments to export, we're hoping to, export through the Pacific. 
Um, there may be another option going out the other way, but um, the port on the Pacific where there is warehouses available is about 200 kilometers away, and a large part of that is on highway. Um, and Los Azules, if you want to look at it differently, we have mainly focused on gold, but we happen to have this large copper project. But if you were to take the price of gold and divide it by copper, copper price, you'd get about 480 pounds of copper is equal to one ounce of gold in terms of value. And then divide it into our um, indicated and inferred resources you'd end up with and include the gold that's in the property of five and a half million ounces, it's low grade, and 190 million ounces of silver, which is also low grade. You would be, um, you'd have better than 60 million ounces of gold equivalent in that deposit, just to give you a sense of its scale. And at the production rate of 415 million pounds a year at $1.14 a pound, that would be equivalent to a little over 900,000 ounces a year gold equivalents at a cost of $550 an ounce at current prices. Just, and I use that just to give you a sense of the magnitude of that deposit. Yes, any other questions? Yes. When do you plan on starting the lower plate drilling in Nevada? That will happen. The drilling in the lower plate, which is the rock that hosts a lot of the gold in barracks deposits 25 miles to the north, uh, we're going to start in the late summer drilling on those targets. We'll have two holes going down uh, about 1,000 meters. So, um, at this point, if you'd indulge me, I'd like to close this meeting off and start our annual meeting and then right after that we'll we'll quickly go through the financials not so quickly and we'll have Carmen go through the formalities so I'm here to welcome you to the annual meeting thank you for coming for the other and I think I'm quickly turning the meeting over to Carmen to serve as chairman is that correct <laughs>